William Hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Okay, um, in the interest of uh, having enough time for our third panel, is that what? Should, we, should someone move over there? No, no, I'll be on my own. Okay, it's good, it's good, I appreciate that. <laughs> Alright, so we are um, convening our third panel on refugees, migrants, and mobs, and uh, I'm not going to reintroduce myself, but I, I am looking forward to introducing some, some fabulous panelists we have up here to, to really talk about the lived experience along the borderland in the wake of a lot of this violence. Um, and so the idea behind this is sort of to talk about the experience of people moving across the border, experiences of people collaborating across the border, and a lot of violence that is associated with that and sometimes the threat of violence. So um, on my right over here in the middle is Alice Baumgartner uh, from Yale University. Um, on my far left is Bill Kerrigan uh, from Rowan University. Um, See, Alejandra, there she is. Um, Alejandra Diaz de Leon from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Um, Miguel is on the far, my far right, your far left. Uh, Miguel Gonzalez Quiroga from Universidad Autonoma, uh, wait, Autonoma de Nueva Leon. I apologize. Um, and to my direct left here is Sonia Hernandez from Texas A&M University. Um, and we're joined by Diane Solis, who is a Dallas Morning News journalist and won the National Association of Hispanic Journalists 2006 Journalist of the Year Award. Um, and I'm particularly excited to have her with us because she's been working uh, recently on migration and the, the, the refugee migrant crisis along the border. So last panel, we sort of worked our way through history up to the present day. I think we're going to start the opposite direction here, and I was going to ask Diana if she wouldn't mind talking about the current refugee situation along the border. Sure. Well, the very word refugee is, is a legal status that's so hard to get. Um, and I see so many people lately, lately being the last five years, who are fleeing violence and trying to get asylum. Among them, uh, among the most memorable was a woman named Betty, and she narrated her story to Alfredo Corchado and I about three years ago, and she was a fabulous storyteller, and it was as though she were fleeing Satan. She said that her husband was involved in the Zetas, and that violence was a regular part of their life, and their children saw it in... One child was even a witness to a firefight, and and he was abusive, and so eventually she made herself um, she made her way to to Dallas, and she's part of a huge increase in the number of Mexicans who are seeking asylum. The number of Mexicans seeking asylum has tripled, and you can sort of see that arc or that trajectory going up along with the violence at the border, and. Uh, uh, in 2012, for example, there were 11,000, nearly 11,000 requests for, for asylum. And, and she just wanted a normal life for her children. And they, one of them even told her, why don't you just kill daddy? We want a normal life. And another one had witnessed a firefight in a soccer field in San Luis Potosi. And he would act out in Dallas area schools. Um, he made himself a cardboard gun and he'd go around shooting, uh, pretending to shoot kids. And she showed me letters from teachers who were concerned about that, that child and basically the trauma that the child was carrying. You move from there to all these unaccompanied teenagers um, uh, who came during the surge of 2014 from Central America, from Guatemala, from Honduras, and from El Salvador. And it, uh, the, 
they weren't just teenagers. There were some very, very young people traveling without, without their parents, uh, five-year-olds who were being brought with their 13-year-old siblings. And I think of the border as a moving border. And you can see that border moving through our federal immigration courts, where any one of you could go and bear witness to the violence of th these kids' lives and these adults' lives. And the federal immigration courts are really like um, a chamber of horror sometimes when you listen to kids telling their stories. And so many of them don't have attorneys. And without an attorney, the kids have a 9 out of 10 chance of being ordered removed. And the, the problem isn't the truth of their story. The problem is their inability to articulate that truth in a winnable way. And more kids are coming. Uh, it went down in 2015 and it started climbing back up in this fiscal year. So you talked about the surge in, in 2014 that we commonly covered and very tied to violence in Central America. How, how has uh, the migration stream changed you know, coming through Mexico, not exclusively Mexicans, but coming through Mexico to the United States in the last 10, 15 years? Well, the, the net Mexican migration is down now, which is a huge, huge thing. Uh, so um, what you see now are Central Americans and uh, Central American families going going way up. And Alejandra has actually done a lot of research on, on Central Americans and, and migration patterns. And I was wondering if you could take the story back a little bit further for us, um, how things have changed in terms of migration and how that has uh, changed since, you know, the, the mid-1980s, um, in this area in particular which you, you've worked on. Yeah, so, uh, so in Central America, most of the migration flows or forced migration flows started in the 80s, 70s with the civil wars in Central America. Well, Honduras didn't have a civil war, but in the other countries. And the amount of violence in the countries forced a lot of people to change addresses. Some were displaced in their own countries or in Central America, and some had to go to the United States. So that was the first flow of migrants, no? It was a big flow of migrants, but not as big as now. Um, then when the economy, well, when the countries were starting to pacify and become slightly democratic, there was, you know, Mitch, the earthquake in El Salvador, uh, the liberalization of the economy in the 90s in Central America. A lot of farmers lost their lands. A lot of people had to move to the cities. They couldn't afford how to live. The violence increased. The United States deported a lot of gang members to Central America who formed the Maras, the violence increased even more. Narco traffic moved to Central America a little bit, so the violence increased even more. So now we're just seeing a surge in Central American migrants fleeing from their lives. That I, I don't think it will decrease if nothing changes in Central America. So yes, I think migration in Central America has been closely linked to poverty and violence, at least in the 80s. There has, it has been ups and downs, but, yeah. And it's really involved the state, both the Mexican state and the, the United States government in terms of regulating this, or, or trying to deal with this migration stream, right? Um, like, how, how have the, the U.S. and Mexican governments uh, um, reacted to these, these different waves that are coming in? I don't know if you want to speak to that, um, Diane. Uh, these different waves of, of people seeking asylum and, ref and, and escaping horrific violence right, in Central America or, or in po uh, poverty and other, other push factors? They've used detention as a deterrent and that's happened with Central American women uh, with children. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy as to who they decide will be detained. There's three detention centers in the U.S. They're under great scrutiny. People are trying to get them closed. Lawyers are trying to get them closed as per something, as per uh, a legal um, agreement called the Flores Agreement that happened many years back. They've, they haven't been successful yet. Um, there were highly publicized raids in January of this year 
and there was a big leak in the Washington Post that these raids might be coming, or as ICE calls them, operations. Uh, it's the people, the immigrants, who call them raids. And um, uh, th th there were lawyers who swarmed into uh, Dili Detention Center to try and help people, and they were successful in, in getting a pause in removals. And the, the U.S. has also um, started a public relations campaign with commercials uh, in in Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala. They've also given money to those three countries to to try and stop uh, people from coming. How has Mexico as a state reacted to? Well, yeah, so um, the United States and Mexico have done all that, but they have also reacted by making migration, like the physical transit and the arrival to the United States way more difficult. So now Central American migrants experience the deterrence policies as soon as they cross the Suchiate River, no? As soon as they are in Mexico, they experience more roadblocks, the train that they get gets faster, they have to bribe so many people, they're mareros, there's narcos charging them money, they get since there's more roadblocks and everything, migrants have to go to more secluded routes, so now they're more vulnerable to crimes by anyone. Uh, it's becoming very, very hard. A lot of people die, get kidnapped, disappear along the way, and that's just crossing Mexico. Then they have to cross to the United States, and then they have to face all those policies in the inside. So, yeah, Mexico is helping detain migrants a lot. However, they still keep coming because they have horrible situations in Central America, so it doesn't seem to be working a lot. Since we have several historians on the panel that can put some context around this, I was going to see if we could talk a little bit about how people have moved across the border in earlier periods, and when there was less of a state involvement and, and, and less of a police state <laughs> along the border itself. So maybe we can move backward in time. I was going to ask Sonia, who's, who's worked on the, the 20th century in particular, sort of, what is it, what was, how do people move across the border around 1900? What was, what was the situation like in terms of access and who could move and, and, and how that worked? So, you know, we're, we're really talking about, you know, pre-1924, you know, border, um, situation so you don't have the presence of the border patrol you have you have the presence of the texas rangers and others you know mounted men so um in terms of um you know the flow of of peoples it was uh, the border was pretty you know it was fairly easy to cross and so you have you know there are you know cycles of 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 immigration certainly um you know one cycle immediately after the the war of 1846 and then another sort of early 20th century um and in, in each cycle you have moments where there were certain limitations, but it was very difficult because you really don't have, you know, the heavy uh, presence or heavy weight of the state. So very different from, you know, the immigration that we're talking about um, uh, right now. Um, we also have to understand that at least some places like the, you know, South Texas Samaulipas border. I mean, that was a shared river valley. It was a, you know, there were, you know, family and friends on both sides of the river, and so it was very, very, you know easy to, you know, go back and forth. It's a very different situation that what we're seeing now. Miguel. When uh, we address the issue of uh, migrants coming to the United States, oftentimes they're escaping violence, and uh, most often, and, and we see a lot of historical continuities in this issue, just like we did in, in smuggling, um, even before there was a border, in the 1830s and 1840s, uh, many Mexicanos who had been uh, uh, deprived of their lands and their dignity uh, by some angry Texans uh, were fleeing toward Mexico. Uh, toward what uh, the Texans perceived was their border on the Rio Bravo. And during the 1850s, uh, in 1859, when uh, Juan Cortina revolted 
and raided Brownsville, uh, many of the citizens of Brownsville uh, crossed the river to Matamoros. They were also seeking refuge. The border as a place of refuge from violence is, is critically important, uh, not only as a generator of violence. In the 1860s, um, Matamoros was attacked several times in, in, in several internal wars, and the people of Matamoros then fled to Brownsville across the river. In the 1870s, with a period, uh, a terrible period of the cattle wars, uh, one eyewitness says that the roads were filled with uh, Mexican carts fleeing toward the border for safety. Uh, because of the race, racially fueled violence against them in South Texas. Uh, during the revolution, uh, San Antonio was virtually transformed by the many migrants escaping the revolutionary violence in Mexico. Uh, the people of Ojinaga uh, in Chihuahua escaped across the river uh, in late 18, 1913 uh, because of the violence, the battle in that city. Um, and, and most recently, like we've been discussing, uh, so many migrants from Central Amer uh, America coming to uh, the United States to escape the violence. We recall also that in Ciudad Juarez, uh, many, many people crossed the border to El Paso and to other places to escape the, the murderous violence there. So uh, these are links in a chain that go back uh, as long as the, uh, there's been a history of the border. That actually brings up another comparison, I think, between the 19th century and what we're seeing now. So Alejandra has shown us how violence um, has helped, or deterrence, have helped to stop and dissuade people sometimes from attempting to cross into the United States, particularly from Mexico, although not so much from Central America. By the same token, in the 19th century, as Miguel was just saying, the violence that was provoked by the cattle wars in the 1870s also seems to have had an effect in stopping people from crossing the border as readily as they did previously. So in the Comisión Pesquisidora, which um, several of us have worked in, there's so many testimonies of ranchers from Mexico saying, oh, I used to cross all of the time to try to recover my cattle, and we can confirm that in um, state archives now, but they reported that in the 1870s, it was so violent that they no longer felt it was worth going. So we're not only seeing a comparison between people seeking refuge in a, across a border, but also deciding perhaps not to go across the border when the violence is too great. We also have like fa families, right? And we have relationships that span the border. We have that today, right? And we have that in the, in the 19th century. And, you know, in the work that the, the panelists have done on the book that we've been doing, that came up time and again, these relationships that span the border, that, that in some cases preceded the establishment of the official 1848 border with the U.S.-Mexico War. Um, so I was wondering if any of the panelists could talk about the persistence of some of those transnational relationships, and especially as the border gets, I don't know, hardened over time, right? And it becomes, in some cases, more violent or more difficult or more challenging uh, to, to cross the border. Yeah, at least in the in the in the case that I that I look at, I look at Gregorio Cortez, who was a um, who was born in the outskirts of Matamoros, Tamaulipas, just across Brownsville, Texas, and he moves to Carn City. He's one of these migrants of the late 19th century. Um, he moves to Carn uh, to Carn City in in, in the, the uh, Carnes County, and um, you know is accused in 1901 of of, uh, of killing a, a, a Texas white sheriff in self defense and. Um, you know, to sort of uh, kind of make a very long story short, um, I want to focus on sort of what um, came about because of the of, of the Cortez affair. And so, what you have is this um, you know transnational transnational alliance that is based on you know these historical patterns of transnational you know border cooperation. 
that included that brought together, you know, working class peoples from as far as Monterrey uh, in Mexico City, um, uh, in Nuevo Laredo, and brought them together with workers from Laredo, Texas, San Antonio, and not just working class peoples, but also members of the Norteño elite, members of the Tejano elite. So you have this, you know, cross class and, it, and at times also cross uh, racial ethnic alliances because of the historical um, historical patterns of that period, um, where it was bit quite normal to you know, um, reach out across the line to cooperate or collaborate on numerous things, including violence, right? So there's a long historical pattern here. And it, can, it could protect people in some cases from violence. When you have relationships, when you know people, when you have family members, that, that is a, that is the, that's one of the wonderful advantages of a society where you're integrated with people you know and can and know who you are. That can be the difference between life and death in certain circumstances if you're accused of something and you have a relationship that you can rely on. Um, one of the things that, that Bill Kerrigan's worked on is is, is violence that's directed against people who don't have those protective networks, who are find themselves because of migration, because of movement, without that kind of support network or alliances that they can draw back on if they find themselves in a difficult situation. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your, your the research that you've done about about lynch mobs specifically. Sure. Sure. So uh, I'm the yeah I'm the mob part of the title of this uh, <laughs> one of the uh, this uh, panel and uh, my research is with uh, Clive Webb who couldn't be here today and uh, he's uh, he and I have written a book together about the lynching of Mexicans in the United States and the article that we wrote here was about cycles of lynching kind of when did periods uh, along the border especially did violence surge and when did it ebb and um, we found that there were in fact periods of heightened uh, mob violence. Uh, usually uh, Anglo mobs lynching uh, Mexicans uh, and the three periods that we found were the 1850s, uh, the 1870s and the, the decade of the Mexican Revolution, really the period between 1915 and, and 1919. And um, there are some uh, factors that we think explain uh, what's going on. I guess one of the important dimensions to begin with is that there is of course uh, a certain level of racial antipathy, racial animus between um, Anglo settlers in Texas and, and Mexican residents, Tejanos, and those new migrants coming in. And that has to be kind of considered. But it's not sufficient to explain the violence because if it was just a racism then you wouldn't see patterns that ebbed and flowed. And so uh, we think that economic conflict uh, and economic issues uh, really explain best these kinds of patterns of, of rise and fall of violence. So what has already been mentioned, uh, the cattle uh, boom in the 1870s, enormous profits can be made. That leads, uh, what I would like to think of is overcoming the hesitation to kill. You know, that I think most people have a hesitation to kill, but if profits uh, are such that uh, they're very tempting in, in that a barrier can be reached and we talked about that with the drug trafficking trade and the present that was true also in the 1870s. Um, in the 1850s, the earlier period, a lot of the violence uh, is in California with the gold rush and once again you can see the opportunity to make money and uh, as especially as the mining claims become more scarce, violence in, increases there. In any event, um, one of the factors is the border and that's one of the things that those whole um, symposium has been about. I just wanted to address a little bit about how does the border influence this violence and there's a few specific ways that it that it does. Uh, lynch mobs are very worried about their uh, uh, targets escaping across the, the border uh, and escaping uh, the wrath of these extra legal mobs and so uh, that means that they're very hesitant to turn them over to the authorities. Uh, they might escape from the authorities and so summary justice is something that they uh, decide to inflict uh, rather rather quickly. Um, the other aspect of course which I, I mentioned I just want to kind of end on it because it's an important point is it's easier to uh, kill or lynch someone who you perceive as other uh, and the, the racial dimension um, it, it's, it's, um, it has to be kind of emphasized even though it's that's not the only factor. It's just not the case that in the California gold fields, Mexicans are as likely to be lynched as any other 
ethnic group or you know French minors or whatever, they're more likely to be lynched. And uh, it's because it's easier to kill someone that you perceive as different. Anyway, long answer to your question, but uh, thank you. I, I think Bill uh, brings up a really important point in terms of certain people who were otherized. Um, and just very quickly, I wanted to point to the role of the media in, on one, on one side of the coin, encouraging um, the otherizing and the sort of, um, you know, uh, perceiving certain individuals as foreign or, or non-citizens. Um, but, uh, for example, in the case of Gregorio Cortez, when um, a mob of 300 men from um, Gonzales, um, uh, Texas, and the greater Carnes County area tried to remove Cortez from the county jail um, to lynch him, um, they were unsuccessful, but a couple of days after that incident, a very reputable press, the San Antonio Express, lamented the fact that Gregorio Cortez had not been, been lynched, right? Because they figured, well, he, he may very well get away with it, and so this is our opportunity. At the same time, just very quickly, I also want to point out to the role of media in creating transnational alliances, as we saw that there's you know, great support for Cortes and to, um, uh, uh, you know, get, acquire funds for his appeals. And a lot of that had to do with certain media outlets encouraging uh, um, collaboration in defense of Gregorio Cortes. Yeah, the media is a really interesting role in all of this. And we, we talk about the drug wars and the way it's been portrayed. And, and I, I was thinking about the refugee and migration questions in terms of how things are portrayed. Uh, and so I wanted to, to swing back around to Diane and Alejandra about what role do you think the portrayal of, of the drug wars and the violence has had on the way that um, migration has been covered and perceptions in US media uh, in particular, but also perhaps in Mexico, I don't know, um, of how that, that, that saturation of violence along the border that's associated with the drug trade um, has or hasn't affected how migrants are perceived and portrayed within, within um, you know, media and popular culture. I can answer with Mexico. <laughs> So in Mexico, uh, when I started studying the media, it surprised me because I expected the Mexican newspapers and national newspapers to go along the lines that I read in Europe, not like invasion of migrants, flooding of migrants, and portraying them as they steal jobs or whatever. And nevertheless, although they do tie migration with violence and with crime, they tie it in a condescending way in which they say, oh, oh poor, poor migrants, they, they suffer all these crimes uh, and the maras and everything, and migrants bring crime to Mexico because the maras try to kidnap them or whatever, or they cross with drugs or anything, but it surprised me very much that the national media in Mexico, at least when they started covering the migration situation, used this condescending tone, and I'm not saying it's better than the other tones, it's just different than what I expected, no? So, yeah. I think there's some very good coverage and, and some that is really awful. Um, uh, Mexicans, for example, um, are treated really horribly if they are unaccompanied minors. Um, under an anti-trafficking law, there are provisions that the unaccompanied minors from contiguous countries can be uh, quickly removed back and Central Americans get pulled out uh, for more extensive review. That's, that's really unfortunate. And there's, there's been some reporting on that, uh, most spectacularly by Melissa Del Bosque at the Texas Observer. Um, and uh, uh, in the presidential election with Trump's rise, you hear conflation of Mexicans with the potential for uh, being terrorists. And there's this leap in logic and conflation even with a Twin Tower attack in New York. And it, it, it just, uh, it's, it's a bit um, wacky. <laughs> 
Amen. Um, all right, well, in the interest of making sure we have time for questions, I wanted to open the floor to anyone who have questions for the panel. And I've got a million if, if we don't, but I'm sure we do. Yes, I'd like to ask the panel, in particular, Ms. Elise, if uh, what I perceive to be a, an interesting comparison uh, would apply, that is, between the deal that has recently been made between Europe and Turkey to help them solve their immigration problem is, is comparable to the what I thought was a deal or influence for help from Mexico to help solve the United States' Central Immigration, Central American Immigration problem. And you want to know if I think it's comparable? Yes. I th I'm not as familiar with what's happened with Turkey and Europe, but the, what's happened in the case of the Central American surge of families and kids, it seems to be a bit, um, oh, I've described it in, to my editors as a, a bipolar po policy. We, the U.S., have now recognized that some of these people could be refugees, and so we started an in-country refugee program, that, and then that program was criticized a lot because if you're fleeing violence, you're going to violence you're not going to stay in country and then more recently a few months ago we the US government the State Department announced that they were going to start accepting um, refugee applications true refugee applications in third countries and we've yet to see how that's going to play out and then we've also given a big package of money to Honduras Guatemala and Salvador to to try and um, I think do uh, to lessen to lessen the the despair. I, I'm not sure exactly how that's worked out. Maybe Alejandra knows. And there's been a bit of press on the U.S. being involved in Mexico's southern border initiative. And I, I recently uh, this this past week I had an interview with the director of ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, and I, I couldn't get uh, the level of financial detail on that that I wanted. They said they'd get back to me, and I hope they do. Uh, well, I think that it's, I understand what you mean, but I think in the case of Europe, uh, Europe is making it explicit that they're hiring Turkey to take the migrants, the refugees, to screen them and to act like as a formal external border, no? Turkey is getting a lot in return, they're getting money, and they will have, their citizens will probably have access to the European Union in the following years, which, which is what Turkey has been wanting for a while. So I think Turkey played it smart, and it's, I'm not saying this is correct, I don't think migrants should be deported back to Turkey, I think it's a terrible idea, but I think Turkey bargained very smartly with the European Union, and it's, it's you know, it's gaining a lot from it, and I don't feel that Mexico and the United States are doing this or are, or are as vocal about these arrangements, although I also have heard from a lot of migrants that in the southern border plan there's American agents supervising and helping. So it's probable that the United States is helping Mexico, but it's not, it's not that cool, and I don't think we Mexicans will get a free pass to the United States anytime soon as a, as a consequence of that. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question which I think is more of an observation than a question. Uh, but as I've been listening to uh, these great uh, discussions, I'm having a hard time figuring out where the U.S. Mexican borderlands <clears throat> are. Uh, I've heard, uh, you know, Central America, I've heard <clears throat> uh, San Antonio. I've heard, um, I think I heard uh, Montreal a while ago. <clears throat> so I want to know a little bit about how, how you might define what we're talking about when we talk about the U.S.-Mexican borderlands. OK. 
Okay, that's a big question. Um, and, and I'm not making light of it. It's a great question. We've actually been talking about that for, la we've, for the last two days. We have been in a room, locked, where we're arguing and discussing different papers about the borderlands. And people have papers starting from Alberto's, which starts in basically the end of uh, New Spain, up until the, you know, the very present you know, migration, drug wars, and everything that we've been talking about in these, some of these panels. And in all of that, the definition of the borderlands has been, it, it, it's, it's evolved and it's, it's wide ranging. I will say what's interesting is that if you do borderlands as a field, it's usually an area of overlapping influence. And there's all kinds of debates about what borders mean, where the lines are. Um, there's a whole field of just theoretical debate about the concept within, within history. I think for our project, one of the things that I've learned from doing all of this is that the borderlands are not just one piece of geography that you can put off to the side and call that the borderlands and safely know what you're talking about. The, there's different borders for different groups. There's the legal boundaries that the nation states decide on, but in the 19th century you have the Comanches who just don't care. <laughs> or use it to their advantage, right? Um, and you have different boundaries depending on, you know, the cartels who transcend the border. You have different people who might see the border as a place of safety because they have connections or they're fleeing the border. Um, and, and because of that, they, they encounter violence in different places. One of the interesting about um, Bill's work is that he's, he begins one of uh, his chapter in our book by talking about a lynching that happens in Nebraska that is tied very directly to what's going on along the border. And so the, the violence reach and the news coverage and all of these things have, have long extensions and that the border can extend down to Guatemala. So one of the things that Alejandra's work is really amazing about is that she talks about these issues of immigration and about enforcement of borders and how the the, the U.S. and Mexico collaboration on, on dealing with migration has extended down to the Mexico-Guatemala border and that you have an, in some ways an extension of U.S. border policy that goes farther south. And with the cartels and the supply chains that stretch from Asia throughout Mexico to the border and all these different connections. So I think that's one of those things that sort of, I want to say it depends on what you're talking about at a given moment, but the border is a place of interaction and people and commerce and all these different things that can extend in all all these different directions in ways that are very powerful and that's what makes it fascinating because it's a nexus point of overlap in all these different ways that can give you a window not just into this geography of the border which is important but into the 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 whole continent and really in some cases with with the commerce that comes through these areas the larger world and so it's a prism into big problems and big questions that stretch you know in all kinds of different directions but have a nexus point that we can use to focus which is the borderlands here thank you so i think it goes without saying that the reach of the Mexican drug cartels does not end at the U.S.-Mexico border. So when people are fleeing from Mexico into the U.S., they obviously may still find themselves within reach of these cartels. But what can you speak to for the Central Americans that are fleeing their home countries? And what is the reach of the Central American gangs that they're fleeing mm -hmm. from? Enough, Diana. Um, well, um, uh, this summer I did field work in Palenque and in Tenosique in the south of Mexico. And you can see in Tenosique and Palenque at least because that's where I was, the attacks of the Mara, uh, the Barrio 18 and MS-13. And a lot of migrants were justifiably or not, because I cannot assert to that, very scared of going out of the shelters, for example, and of showing their faces out because they were sure the Maras were out to get them. And a lot of them were fleeing for them. so. We know from reports that up the way to Veracruz, there's mareros who charge $100 to get on top of the train, and if you don't pay, they throw you out. They kidnap migrants a lot in Coatzacoalcos, and they ask for ransom. So, yes, they do have a wide reach in Mexico, at least until Veracruz, and a lot of people are convinced that they have enough reach, you know, to be able to individually target them and follow them from, I don't know, Tegucigalpa to where they are, so... So yes, they, they're fleeing them, but it's, I don't know, they don't get away from them, I don't know, until San Luis, and then there's the narco traffickers, and then they go to the United States, so yeah, it's. 
Building on that, I was going to ask, I was going to ask Diane because I just don't know the answer. Um, do any of these people who have been detained in the United States, who have fled Central America, I mean, I don't know what the policy is about deporting people back to these countries where this horrific violence is going on. Yeah, there there have been some reports. Um, the Guardian uh, for, uh, newspaper in London did a very good investigation into um, people who had been deported from the U.S. and then later killed in in um, those three countries of Central America. Uh, I think we have time for one last question, if we have one. Uh, thanks. Uh, what are talking about the uh, immigration, an issue that always uh, I find difficult to understand is the issue of race relations in the United States, which I always find hard to even begin to understand. But uh, obviously it's connected to the issue of immigration. How, how good or bad do you think uh, the issue of race relations, violence, prejudice, all of these things are in the border states today. And has this got better compared to the past historically? I mean, we're no longer seeing those kind of level of violence or lynchings that you describe, are we? Or, or I, you know, I don't know. Miguel, do you want to take a stab at that for the historical context? Well, did I understand the question to be, have race relations gotten better in the border region specifically? Well, that's a very complex question. Uh, and I'd have, we would have to give it a lot more thought, I think. But I, I can point out to a few things uh, that might shed some light on this. Uh, this. This symposium is on violence in the border region. And uh, that's the focus. But the reality of the border region, uh, where different racial and ethnic and national groups uh, live, is one more of peaceful, cooperative coexistence than violence. Uh, we were talking about that today a little bit, because uh, all along the border, there are family uh, and commercial and social and cultural networks that are in operation every day. And most of the border crossings and the actions along the border have to do with friendly, peaceful, cooperative, beneficial exchange and not with violence. But it's violence that generates the headlines, uh, sometimes fueled by drugs or illegal trafficking, oftentimes complemented uh, by racism and bigotry. But uh, I'd like to think that there's more cooperation than violence, but it doesn't get the press, it doesn't get the play that violence gets. And uh, if relations have improved, uh, race relations, they've always been uh, ambivalent or mixed. Uh, there are some people who are racist, uh, who have always been racist. There's always been uh, racist and bigots along the borderline. But mostly there have been a lot of people who are understanding, uh, who have intermarried between the races. And uh, that's another reality that we have to look at. Uh, I don't know if there's more racism now than there was. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, social media and a lot of other uh, modernization and improvements are, are modifying that. Um, but I'd have to give it a lot more thought. Uh, I'll just, um, I have no idea about the, the solution to kind of the ongoing issues. I'm, I'm a historian who's most comfortable up to maybe the 1920s. But I do have a story of U.S. Uh, federal and Mexican government cooperation that I think is maybe worth uh, sharing. Um, the last uh, lynching in our study in Texas is 1926. It happens in Raymondville, Texas. And what happens is the sheriff takes uh, three Mexican men out of the jail in the middle of the night and shoots them in the head and leaves their bodies to rot in the desert. 
And um, this is sadly not an, uh, a new occurrence, not an unusual occurrence. It had happened many times before. And what was different this time was that ultimately the account of the sheriff, which was that the uh, prisoners tried to escape and he had to, you know, kill them in the escape attempt. That excuse had been accepted more or less by uh, state and federal authorities before and nothing had ever happened. In this particular case, um, and this had been building for a while, the Mexican government got involved because uh, one of the individuals was a Mexican national and they demanded um, investigation and they spent resources on it and um, they uh, also got the attention of the federal government and by this point the federal government had decided that they also wanted uh, for this kind of uh, violence to end. So the federal government became involved and uh, not, that's not the only time it ever happened but it's very rare that an individual in this case would, would face any kind of prosecution and this sheriff was a popular World War I veteran and uh, he was very shocked when he uh, was indicted on a murder charge as a result of this uh, cooperative activity. Now, he did not get convicted of murder by the all-white jury that oversaw him, but what is really fascinating about this case is that the federal authorities did not give up. And we make a comparison to the 1964 case in Mississippi when, of course, the people who murdered the three civil rights activists weren't actually convicted of murder but of violation of civil rights. What happened to the sheriff, Sheriff Teller, was that he was uh, convicted of a federal crime, the crime of peonage, because they found in their investigation that in addition to this, he also would arrest Mexicans on charge of vagrancy and make them work on his cotton plantation. And uh, that was a federal crime. And so they actually did send him away to the penitentiary. Um, and we argue that this made a difference, that it was a visible symbol that the two governments were cooperating, they weren't going to accept local accounts of what had happened with violence in the past. And what you see at that point is that violence against Mexicans continues but in a different way, in a less public way. It's not so easy for uh, mobs to get away with it. And so um, I have no idea if that will help us in today's modern uh, issues. Well, it's probably the most hopeful ending we could have, right? So with that, I'll say if you could join me in saying thank you to this panel and all the panelists. I want to say on behalf of the Clemens Center and the Instituto Mora, we're all thrilled that you guys came out today and we really appreciate it. So have a great rest of the day. Thank you. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like, follow, or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it, even when you call.